it's really a pleasure and an honor to gather here today uh, to welcome, as I'll tell you in a moment, back to the University of Chicago, Dr. Graciela Marquez, uh, who, as you all know, and as you can see there, has been appointed uh, Minister of the Economy in the new government of Mexico that is coming into office on December 1st. Um, first, uh, I have to say that she's an old friend of this university, and indeed in the year 2010, 2011, she was a visiting professor of history at the University of Chicago. So it's really a double pleasure for us to have her here. She uh, holds a PhD in economic history from Harvard and has been for many years a research professor at El Colegio de Mexico and now has been called uh, to public service. As I'm sure all of you know, uh, Mexico had an important, I would say, historic election uh, in July. Uh, and uh, a very different government was elected, uh, one which indeed also for the first time in many, many years won by landslide and you know, by an absolute majority of uh, all of those who voted. It represents a, a significant departure, we'll have to see how far it goes, um, with, uh, from the governments that have been in charge of Mexico even since 2000 when the, you know, um, the, the parties in power began to alternate. There is, uh, as the vote shows, uh, it's fair to say, a great deal of expectation and hope in the eyes of many that this new government in Mexico will uh, address uh, long-standing issues. And certainly the economic side of it is uh, at the heart uh, of those aspirations um, and those hopes. So it is very timely and uh, also um, um, a great opportunity for us at the University of Chicago to, um, to have the opportunity to have uh, Dr. Marquez here to speak to us uh, shortly before she takes office uh, about, as the title says, Mexico's new economic prospects. Uh, I anticipate that uh, she will outline uh, significant departures from the kinds of policy policies that have governed Mexico really over the last several decades, to say the least. Uh, and so um, we're all, um, we all have great expectations and uh, look forward to seeing how things develop once they take office. As is uh, usual in these events, for those of you who haven't joined us before, after her prepared remarks, uh, we will open the floor for your questions. So um, let me then just uh, welcome back to the CAT Center and to the University of Chicago, Dr. Graciela Marquez, bienvenida. Gracias. Uh, first of all, um, I'm very glad to be back in Chicago. Uh, we really spent a, a wonderful and productive year in 2010-2011. We actually uh, enjoy the weather and enjoy the blizzard in March. Uh, and so we have uh, warm memories from, from our stay. And uh, my, my kids, when I was coming here, told me like, oh, please go to the library and buy such and such. They, they really get, uh, got to know the university pretty well. Uh, back then I was a, a researcher. I was uh, studying the fiscal history of Mexico. And I'm here to talk about the economic perspectives of the new government. In preparing the presentation, I decided to uh, take the opportunity to reflect on long-term uh, issues and to frame uh, some of the main um, policies that would begin, uh, would, uh, begin in um, December 1st. So let me just start by uh, pointing out, this is the GDP per capita of Mexico in a long run perspective. This is from 1940 to 1918. And what is clear is that uh, in the early 1980s, there was a turning point, a turning point that really slowed down the economic performance of Mexico. Um, and uh, as you can see, the orange line shows 
that uh, Mexico took a completely different path from the one that was occurring before. That is low growth has had important consequences for the well-being of, million of me millions of Mexicans, but also has important consequences for the future of Mexico, because there has, not, there has been a collapse in public investment, a, a collapse in uh, investment in human capital, and a collapse in uh, welfare policies. Taking a sexenio perspective, what we uh, know is that the problem is not only not only the lack, uh, the, the slowdown of the Mexican economy, but its persistence. It has been persistent a very low growth rate in the last at least three or more decades. And the problem of growing this is low growth is that other economies behave completely different. Let me see. Ah, okay, here is the pointer. Mexico is the red line. Other economies, and I'm, I'm here, I'm not comparing with uh, fast growing economists. The first one um, is uh, South Korea. It's uh, the purple one is Thailand, the usual suspects, I should say, uh, but only uh, Nigeria has been uh, below Mexico and even it surpassed our growth uh, uh, trajectory in the early 2000s. So the problem is not only that Mexico diverge from its historical pattern, but also that other economies have been growing very, very fast. And of course, that slow down in growth necessarily reflects into poverty. Poverty's, poverty levels in Mexico are uh, persistent. So uh, between a slow growth, uh, persistent, um, poverty, but also this graph uh, shows you that more than 40% of the population works and, no, sorry, it's 40% of the population that receive a salary do not have enough to buy the uh, minimum food basket. That is called the poverty wage. You work and you are condemned to be poor and to be below the poverty line. And this is Conabal information, right? So if you are a worker, you are condemned to be on, uh, 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 to belong to the poverty sector of society. E even working in a formal work, in a formal job, uh, you would be, uh, you would not earn enough to buy the, 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 the food basket. On the macro, at the macroeconomic level, and this graph uh, allows me to, uh, to tell you about the fears that the new government would, uh, would in debt endeudar, in debt, the, the Mexican economy. The bad news is that it's already in debt. It's already there, so don't worry. It, it's there. Um, it's an interesting graph. The red line shows you the uh, trajectory of, of, uh, of public debt. And the different lines, in, uh, the, the lines in different colors shows you the perspectives in that day, in that year. So let's, let's go to 2012. This is the uh, 
public, uh, public debt in 2012, and the perspectives wa were that the, uh, the public debt would decrease substantially by the, in the following years. What happened is that it grew. Then in 2013, the perspectives um, were that it would increase a little bit and then it would slowly go down and it went up. And then on 2014, the perspectives were again that it would, um, it would grow a, a little bit and then it would, re it would decline and it grew again and again and again and now it's more than uh, by 2017 it was more than 50 percent of GDP uh, the level of indebtedness of the Mexican economy so we're already indebted uh, and this is the increase in um, so Mexico sometimes I, I, I keep repeating my students that hiring, borrowing money uh, from uh, domestic markets or international markets is not a bad policy in itself. It depends on what uses do you, uh, where do you apply that money, the money you're borrowing, borrowing from um, financial markets. The problem with Mexico is that it borrowed money, a lot of money, as a percentage of GDP, actually, uh, uh, it borrowed money, but it did not increase public investment. So it was just current expenditures, gasto corriente, instead of uh, investment. So the level of investment in 2016 was lower than the level of invest public investment in 2009. So by not investing what we borrow from financial markets, then we reduce the possibilities of, of higher growth in the future, right? Again, look that Mexico is among the few countries that had this behavior. Others, again, the usual suspects, Korea, Estonia, Czech Republic, uh, invest more and more than Mexico. And let me go to one of my favorite topics when talking about economics, which is not economics, but demographics. The demographic dimension of the prospects of the Mexican economy. One third, less, 30 million, 30 million uh, Mexicans uh, are below 30 years old. Many of them study here in Chicago. Uh, <laughs> uh, and so we have this opportunity, and this is part of what it's called the demographic bonus, el bono demográfico. That we have a large uh, proportion of the population in in work in a working age, so that they can work and work and save. This demographic transition uh, began around 1985 and will continue up 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 until 2030. Thir uh, yeah, 2030. The problem is that from 1985 onwards, we haven't been able to provide jobs to that segment of the population. They haven't had the opportunity to save. And by not having that opportunity to save, then we would face a lot of problems in the future, a lot of problems in the 2030s, 2040s, 2050s. I might not be here, but the problems will still continue, and they are very large, very large problems for the future. So regardless of the winner of the election of 2018, there are huge challenges for the Mexican economy in the next, not in the next sexenio, but in the next decades. And we have to do something about it. Let me continue with the youth. 
this graph shows you the percentage of those uh, youngsters that are in at school. So by age 15, 82% uh, of the, is the, the first line, 82% of uh, women are in school at national level and I uh, can see 81%. Uh, but then those percentages drop very fast. See? Uh, by the age of 19, college age, only 40% of, of young people is at school. So we're not preparing our future workforce. By the age of 18, 60% uh, 18, of the population is out of school. That means that they are, at, at best, high school dropouts. It's even more problematic in, uh, well, it's, it's, it's problematic in both worlds, but a, a, a bit more um, extreme in the case of women. And there, there is a sharp contrast between uh, Chiapas and Mexico City. In Mexico City, uh, the drop, the, the, the drop be below 50% is at the age of 20. In Chiapas, the drop is around 17. So they don't even go to, to high school. So we have a, a young population that is not being educated, which is bad enough. The problem is not only education. They are dying. See, this is, this is a graph that should, be, should have a different shape. And this is a very sad graph because, let me see, otherwise, this is very unusual. Between the age of 15 and 30, uh, it's the highest rate of homicides among male young Mexicans. We are not only not educating Mexicans, young Mexicans, but we are allowing them uh, to die in the streets uh, on, on violent crimes. Even, even in the case of women, it's the same. However, it's, it's, the rate is much lower. But see, the higher rates are concentrated among uh, Mexican females below 30 years old. So, we are not educating young people. We, uh, they are dying in the streets all around Mexico. And they are uh, uneducated. Uh, putting together bo both variables, what we see is that those who died, especially after 2007, are those who have primary schooling or below, secondary schooling or below. So there is a huge representation of un uneducated youngsters that died in the streets of Mexico. So, of those who are not in school, who are dead, where are the rest? They are incarcerated. So, uh, most of them with primary or secondary schooling. By not educating them, we are condemn condemning them to die or to go to jail. And when asked about why do they committed some crimes, 
The main reason is because they couldn't find jobs. So beyond, beyond uh, past records or the performance of past government in terms of economic development, we have a great, we as Mexicans have a great challenge. And we have to do something because if we do what we have been doing for the last three decades, we, we would get the same results. So we really have to do something different. The um, economic platform of Mr. Lopez Obrador, oh, I thought it was in English, so it is in Spanish. That's good. Um, so the, the, the economic platform uh, has a strong commitment of fiscal responsibility. And then you, you might say, well, might be, might be true, might be not. Maybe it's a campaign promise that he would not hold. And here, what it's important to remember is his, uh, is the, the, the trajectory of the government of Mexico City between 2000 and 2005. And the level of uh, indebtedness remained at, at workable levels, and there was no, um, there was no huge expand, expansion of expenditures when he was mayor of Mexico City. So he has uh, committed to a no tax reform program, which means that there would not be tax increases in the next uh, years, which provides certainty to investors on the one hand, and requires a careful design of expenditure policy. That's why uh, in each, in each uh, ministry, in each secretaria, we have to really uh, pay attention on the structures, the bureaucratic structures, as well as uh, the subsidies that we uh, manage in different programs. And in part of uh, trying to, I shouldn't say solve, but to face the problems of, of the demographic situation in Mexico, there is this very important uh, program, Jóvenes Construyendo Futuro, which is the idea, first of all, not, not um, first of all, a recognition of the problem. Uh, Lopez Obrador always uh, mentioned something that I really like, which is that in Mexico we did not solve the problems of young people, but we, but the only thing we did is like uh, giving them a name, ninis, ni estudia ni trabaja. Instead of of, of working or, or on trying to find solutions, we just call them ninis. So we don't call them ninis. We will try to incorporate them into the productive activity and in, in, in education. And, uh, and it's difficult. It's difficult because it, it's, uh, these are almost teenagers that left school at the age of 15, 14. And they have been in the streets doing nothing or doing very little. So we have to re-channel them into schools or to train them in, in factories, in workshops, so that they can eventually become uh, part of the workforce. Uh, the program is designed to uh, capture 2.6 million young people and, and give them for one year, a scholarship of uh, around six, between five and six thousand pesos. It's a challenge. It's probably the, the largest social program of its kind in the world. But because of the figures I showed you before, we have to do it. We have to do 
something for those who would be the product who would be in the productive life in the next 50 years so jóvenes construyendo futuro it's uh, one of the many social programs that would be uh, implemented uh, throughout 2019 but of course demographics is not the only problem mexico is facing we only we we also have to the the problem of violence the day before yesterday uh, the um, lopez obrador presented uh, the the program uh, of uh, paz y seguridad and here i want to emphasize the name of the program paz y seguridad we don't want just a program of a seguridad program we want a, a program that stresses the idea that mexico needs a pacification program because there are a lot of violence that generated more violence we need to build we need to find the social roots of violence and in terms of uh, economic policy, we need to insist the importance of sustained, inclusive, and sustainable economic growth. Uh, we will be working not only to produce more uh, work, to produce more, uh, to attract uh, investment, public and, and private investment, in different regions of the of the country there are at least five or six regional uh, economic programs including the the tren maya the the train along the uh, frontier with guatemala and uh, and the transismic train that good that it, uh, both projects are directed to produce more and more jobs uh, an important component is the investment in infrastructure. The level of public investment in Mexico is 2% of GDP. This is very low. This is very low for the level of, of uh, development in Mexico, of, of Mexico's development level. Uh, usually, it should be around six, eight percent. The level of private investment is around 20 percent of GDP. It should be around 25, 24, 26 percent. So the idea is that it's important the investment infrastructure in, in infrastructure to attract more and more private capital. So Mexico needs to grow uh, in a sustained, inclusive, and sustainable uh, manner, but with uh, private investment. And finally, we need, and, and these are more uh, sort of um, goals of the Ministry of the Economy, Me Mexico needs to find formulas to growth by combining the domestic market, uh, promo the promotion of domestic market and global economic forces. We don't have to choose. For many, many years, we built an export platform that it's important for the Mexican economy, but it's not the only alternative. We have to combine this export platform with a uh, domestic market a strategy and because of uh, employment in Mexico 80% or more of the Mexican employ, uh, uh, employees work for a small or medium enterprise we need to support those this kind of, of uh, enterprises so we want to have a specific programs to connect those as uh, small and medium enterprises to supply change and chains 
and then to participate in not only in global markets but also in domestic markets. There are many, many other economic challenges, uh, but I wanted to stress the importance of, of uh, changing the emphasis of economic policy given the demographics that I, I attempt to show today. Uh, mm, okay, now I'll leave it for that and thank you very much. I, I, I will really look forward to listen to your questions. Thank you. <laughs> So we do have some time for questions. We are recording this, so uh, my colleague Franco here will pass the microphone. The only thing that I ask is that you ask limit them. yourself to asking a question, <laughs> <laughs> so that uh, she has a time time to answer, and so we can get to as many of you as possible. So, yeah. so I will moderate. Um, hi, Dr. Graciela. Thanks again for being here. I was earlier in the, with the, the students in the chat. And I would love to hear your thoughts on how um, the Ministry of Economy is planning on acting on informality being such an important economic issue in Mexico. And I personally haven't had the opportunity to hear a lot about the incoming government on this topic. Thank you. Shall we? OK. Um, People do not lie in bed and say, okay, today it's a good day for being an informal worker. It's a very difficult decision. Because if you're informal, you will not have a retirement fund. You will not have health coverage in your old days. So it's very difficult. But might be the only opportunity you have for the present. And then that, that problem grows. And it, co it, it, it is combined then later with cr organized crime, and it complicates the entire economy. At the same time, the question is, why is that people go so easily to informality? Even, even worse, formal uh, enterprises left the formal economy and moved to the informal markets. So the question is why? Why is that happening? And part of that is that it's very difficult to be an entrepreneur in Mexico. It takes uh, two and a half years to get a construction permit in some municipalities in Mexico. Two and a half years. Once you get the permit, your credit is gone. Right? So we have to act, we have to regulate to deregulate. We have to facilitate the creation of wealth. And in the Ministry of the Economy, we are convinced that part of our goal is to reduce the obstacles and the hurdles that enterprises face when they try to open a new business. Even more difficult to close a business. It's just impossible. Go to the bank and try to cancel your bank account. It is impossible. I'm, I'm trying to do so in one of my uh, accounts. I won't, I won't reveal the bank name. But I, I spent almost an hour and a half on Thursday. And I need to prepare the budget. So hour and a half, it's a lot of time. Uh, it's impossible. Why is that you want to cancel? None of your business. I want to cancel my account, period. Uh, it's very difficult to cancel a business in Mexico. To open one and then the closure process. So we have to facilitate that process. I understand that some of the regulations are in place in fear of corruption. 
The problem is that we did not resolve the corruption, but we implemented many uh, procedures. So we have to either, we can do both things. We can reduce corruption and we, want, we, we can also act on reducing the number of procedures you have to follow to open whatever business. So we, will li we would like to work on that direction. Uh, we also would like to um, enhance the role of um, development banks in Mexico so that uh, we can reduce some of, of the financial costs of borrowing, borrowing money. Um, and for the micro level enterprises, uh, we want to create um, microfinancing institutions that uh, now are very, very expensive. Uh, some of, the, of these institutions, for instance, um, charge 98% or more for uh, low income credits. So there is no reason why it's, it's easier to buy a house, it's, it's cheaper to buy a house in Mexico than to borrow money to uh, start a new business. Why is it the, the rate difference, interest rate difference goes from 8 to 12% for a, for a credit to buy a, a house and 98% or more to start a new business. To start a torteria or a taqueria, you have to pay 98%. So we want to um, incentivize the uh, development of a microfinancing institution. Gracias por su presentación. My name is Ana Guajardo. I am actually um, with an organization that is currently incubating Worker Cooperative in the southeast side of Chicago, and we're part of the Illinois Worker Cooperative Alliance. Um, so I know that as an incubator that's trying to form worker cooperatives in here in the state of Illinois, um, we've also been trying to see how we can work with Mexico and some of the worker co-ops in Mexico. And we're actually, a lot of the work that we're doing and in incubating, we're modeling from Mexico and how you guys incubate your worker co-ops. Uh, and I know it's a lot different in Mexico. The laws are more in favor of the formation of co-ops than they are here in the state of Illinois, um, particularly worker co-ops. So my question would be, there's one particular co-op we're trying to incubate, Salsa Tonancing. We're trying to bring chiles from Mexico and me, tomatillos. And so we're trying to figure out, like, the importation of these products from Mexico and how we can work in collaboration with some of the cooperativistas allá in Mexico um, as a way of maybe creating employment there as well, but also helping here the immigrant workers that we're actually working with. So I'm just curious to hear what, if there's any ideas or plans on working on exchanging um, what are, products or items um, from both the U.S. and Mexico and how we can work in more in collaboration. The problem with, um, with this project is that scale. We have a scale project in terms of uh, to be profitable, the importation of, say, tomatillos. Uh, it's very expensive if, if you do it in a small scale. So we have to find ways of bundle, bundling together, bundle, bundling together uh, projects so that we can import not only the tomatillos but many other stuff uh, and reduce the cost and make it profitable. Otherwise, it's very, very expensive. And that's why we want to work on the logistics. One of the uh, Lopez Obrador project is connecting, oh, at least at the beginning, uh, Guerrero and Oaxaca and Hidalgo municipalities, all the municipalities up in the mountain building what it's called Caminos Rurales, small roads, connecting with the small roads to, the, to highways. Because we are just like in 16th, 16th century, that people live up in the mountain with no connectivity. But this connectivity would connect, would bridge the 16th century with the 21st century. 
because it would not only build roads, these Caminos Rurales, roads, but also they would connect the, those communities with the internet. So it would be a jump from 16th century up to 21st century. So by connecting those communities, it, it would be opportunities for cooperatives to, uh, to get into first regional markets, national markets, and international markets. So there are these, these ideas and opportunities. Uh, the Ministry of the, what would be now uh, Secretaria del Bienestar, before CEDESOL, she's the head of one of a very successful uh, cooperative in the state of Puebla. Uh, and uh, they start uh, a very, very uh, a small cooperative, and now they are exporting pepper and other agricultural products. So there, there would be a rescue of cooperatives, and we're thinking on how to help those cooperatives uh, with fiscal incentives. Because the burden of, of, of fiscal uh, requirements for those small organizations sometimes are, are very difficult to meet. Thank you for the presentation today. And, and my question will be like, I know that you are a renowned scholar in, in history and you know, you have an uh, outstanding, you know, like uh, some articles and everything. But I want you to convince us that you have the experience and the abilities <laughs> to basically to, to this position. So basically, how can we be convinced that after being in academia for many years, you are the, you know, the right person with the abilities and skills to be in this job and not be just like a high paid and high renowned intern. It's, it's just because I didn't study in Chicago that they're telling me so. Uh, uh, let's see. Do you know Ben Bernanke? Okay, Ben Bernanke was an economic historian that uh, was the chief of the Federal Reserve. And he left the University of uh, Columbia and directly from his uh, office in Columbia went up to the Federal Reserve. It, 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 often, it happens very often. We academics spend a lot of time reflecting, studying, uh, analyzing. But it might not be my case. I understand that. Uh, I'm not even, uh, I, I study economics. But I decided to study the part of the economics related to history, which I don't think it's a defect. I'm, I tend to think that it's, it's something good, but I might be wrong. So when I was invited, I decided that all my co collaborators would be very uh, long-term uh, public officials. So all the secretaries, so undersecretaries that I invited to my team, and mo most of the, um, the heads of the different parts of the secretaria are very long-term officials. So I'm relying on the experience, not on my own experience, but the experience of others. Uh, and I don't think I need to convince you because, it, no, no, in the sense that, I, what can I say? Oh, I'm very, I write very nice papers, and I like very, that, that I know it's not useful. I, uh, I have taken this job very seriously. I had my doubts at the beginning, of course. Uh, but I have uh, been, I have been enjoying my, my job a lot. I, um, as I told you, I study economics at UNAM, and then I study economics at the Colegio de Mexico. I graduated first in my class in both institutions. And I, I, I study economics, and I learned a lot in economics as many other public officials. Now, studying is one thing, 
uh, enter into the government is a different one. But most of the public officials go to schools and then uh, they, they, they are trained. On the other hand, uh, I think it's refreshing for the government. Uh, Claudia Sheinbaum, when she, which is now mayor of Mexico City, when she was first incorporated into the, in the government of Mexico City, she left his, her um, office at UNAM and went directly to build the segundos pisos in Mexico City. So I think uh, I might have some trade, some um, training for the job and be sure that the moment I realize that I'm not capable, I, I go back to academia because for me, teaching is an honor. Teacher, teaching is more important than being Ministry of the Economy. So I will happily go to El Colegio de México to join Reinaldo in the aisles of, of El Colegio de México. Let me just add, because that was a very honest <laughs> answer, but also a very modest one. So let me just take my privilege as moderator to say that, you know, Mexico has a long recent history of incompetent people appointed to high cabinet offices, men, almost all of them, if not all of them, uh, because they're friends or someone or because they have some business interest connected to the ministry. If you are going to get new ideas, you need fresh blood. And, you know, uh, there is no question in my mind, or she wouldn't be here speaking in front of us, that she is as qualified as many of the, the people who've served in that position. Um, if by qualification you mean prior experience in public service, that is a double-edged sword because on the one hand you have people who are in the system and so on and have reproduced the vices of the system and on the other hand you are not allowing for new perspectives. So I know you can't say this but I will say this. You know, <laughs> I, I think that it is a, an enormous asset and especially because she's wisely surrounded herself with people who have that kind of bureaucratic experience to actually have the opportunity for Mexico after, I mean, if, you know, we, we've had a sort of technocratic government in Mexico since the 1980s. It's gonna be 40 years now. You look at the numbers, you tell me what the great technocrats with a great deal of experience in that kind of work have produced for Mexico, and then wonder whether it's a bad idea or a good idea to actually give the opportunity to new people to try what they, and see what they can do. So, in my opinion, and I'm sorry to, to have to do this, but I know that you can't do this, I, I think it is to be celebrated that uh, people like Graciela are getting the opportunity to introduce new ideas to Mexico and to move the government in a different direction. Um, Again, thank you very much for coming. And uh, my question was, uh, will some of the investment projects, like for example, the airport in Mexico City, continue to be justified by what some would call illegal referendums? Um, some of those investment projects that have investors mm -hmm. worried. As you know, the, Mex the, the new government would take office in December 1st. What the government does before that is not cannot be illegal because president-elect has not take o taken office. So he can consult in the manner they, he's not abide by any law to follow certain rules. Beginning in December 1st, there are certain laws that all public officials have to follow. So in that moment, you can call illegal. illegal. Before that, we might not like the consulta but it's not illegal. Just to follow up on that, how does Andres Manuel expect to attract uh, foreign investment, like foreign capital for the infrastructure projects if there's not certainty in uh, like infrastructure projects can be, can be canceled? Uh, by a consulta, which I, I, don't, I don't care if it's illegal, illegal or not, but it, they can be canceled. So like, investors cannot, cannot uh, bring capital if there's no certainty. Uh, I think uh, you're right about the, the, the perspective of, of uh, the uncertainty. If I would be an, inv an investor in the past decade or so, for me it would be very difficult and it would be very uncertain 
uh, given the level of corruption. Remember the, the train, the Querétaro train that was canceled because of corrupt practices. The, the surrounding uh, construction in the, in, the, in the airport, La, La Barda Perimetral, uh, was um, given to a ghost enterprise, an empresa fantasma. So some decisions might cost the reduction of, of, of uncertainty, but, uncertain, but corruption also causes uncertainty. So I think uh, that by providing rules in terms of who's getting the contracts, I think you are increasing investment. There are many investors that are interested in the Tren Maya, in the Tren tra Transismico, and many other infrastructural projects. So I don't think it would necessarily, the cancellation of the airport project would necessarily reduce the attraction of foreign capital. Hi, uh, my name is Juan Pablo, and um, thank you very much for being here. It's, um, I would say, an honor to have uh, the, the, the next for, uh, economic ministry from Mexico. So my question is more regarding you have, uh, or the AMLO presidency has a lot of programs, like you mentioned, and all, all of them sounds very good in paper. But you also mentioned that you will commit to fiscal responsibility. Mm -hmm. So how do you plan to fund all those programs, including the Tren Maya and, and, and the... The, the education of the youth and everything. I, I know that everybody knows here that we have a problem in education in Mexico, but it's, it's tough to fund it if we don't have the resources, right? Uh, we, are, we are closing on the, on the budget for 2019, and we have found uh, enough resources to fund the 25 projects already. So we would reduce some areas, we would uh, make some savings, and uh, with no new borrowing from uh, financial markets. So, so far it's working, and we do believe that we can also increase the uh, tax collection for the next two or three years. Thank you for your presentation. Um, can you tell us concrete policies that uh, you're going to put in place to face two challenges? First, the uh, drug money that floods Mexican economy, and the second, the uh, drug money, cartels, drug, narco drug money that floods okay. Mexican economy, and the second is the the second challenge is the United States current administration. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, for the drug money, and in general, unfortunately, it's not only drug money. It's organized, now, by now, it's m bigger than drug money. Hopefully, it would be only drug money. It's drug money, but it's also organized crime in many, many different um, regards. So, uh, we have the Unidad de Inteligencia Financiera, the WIFI, that now would be closely, working very closely to the intelligence uh, unit in other um, areas of the army. Um, but particularly is working very closely with the financial institutions. Not regulating the financial institutions, but, close, but uh, working closely with them. We believe that there is still room to find ways to detect illegal operations uh, early in the in the change of, of, of laundering money in Mexico. Um, there are also opportunities by better fiscalization. The Mexican econo the Mexican government is lagging behind of uh, digital uh, strategies. We need to improve the, in, in many government public uh, instances, uh, people think that by um, 
scanning some documents, they are doing digital policy. And digital policy is more, more than that. Uh, I always tell the, 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 the story about the acta de nacimiento. Now you can print your own acta de nacimiento, right? Uh, you, you add your curve and your name and so on and so forth. You pay 67 pesos. I know that because I did it three weeks ago. 67 pesos and then you print in your own, in your own printer your acta de nacimiento. That is wonderful, isn't it? You don't have to go to Arcos de Belén. All the way through Arcos de Belén. So you print, it's all, all, all over Mexico. If you were born in Tapachula, you can. But now, public institutions are, are asking citizens for something very strange, which is un acta de nacimiento actualizada. It does exist. Uh, updated uh, birth certificate. What is that? Oh, then you, you have, uh, because the, the, the print you get has a, a little space with the date. Uh, so if you go to the ISTE or to other public office, you have to present the Acta de Nacimiento Actualizada. Why do you need an Acta de Nacimiento Actualizada? If you already have the data, you have to process uh, all the requirements. You don't, you don't need to ask the citizen to, to print the Acta de Nacimiento Actualizada. So, and this is just a, a brief parenthesis to tell you that we need to, to do better in law enforcement and better uh, verification of, of money circulating in the Mexican um, economy by better digital strategies in the financial system. In April and again in June and recently three, three weeks ago, there have been hack, uh, hacking, hackings in, um, in different financial institutions. The one in April was an attack to the Banco de Mexico, right? to the funds that uh, uh, private banks deposit on the Bank of Mexico. I, I, don't, I don't think we can say that that cannot happen. Of course, that happens all the time. But we have to invest more money in, in digital uh, diagnostics of, of money laundering in Mexico. And the second. <laughs> What to do with the current U.S. administration? Uh, hope for the best. I don't know. Um, uh, no, I think, no. Uh, at least in terms of commercial policy, I do have a, a strategy, which was, uh, uh, has been, um, we, we are already working on that, that it's, uh, we need to work at subnational level. We need to talk and work with governors and city mayors and tell them how important Mexico is for Nevada or for Nebraska or for the city of Chicago or for the city of San Diego or for the city of Los Angeles, the traditional ones or the new ones. Mexicans, Mexicans in the US are, are already migrating to different areas. We need to work with those uh, governors that might not have been uh, very involved in migration policies, but now they have to. And they have to do a lot with Mexico. So we are working, we have a strategy for working with uh, not only the usual uh, lobbying in Washington, the, lo the usual lobbying in DC, hiring a uh, a law firm to, to do the, the cabildeo, to do the um, lobbying, but also with, directly with the go governors, directly with the state le legislatures, directly to, uh, to those public officials that had a direct incidence on the lives of Mexicans living in the U.S. and the lives of, 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 of many others that engage in business every day.
Hello. <coughs> Hello, good evening, uh, Dr. Graciela Marquez. Uh, thank you for your talk today. Um, I would like to ask about the, the plans um, or policies that the government, the new government from AMLO is planning to implement to promote innovation into the Mexican economy and how they are planning to incorporate that into the, uh, I guess, the, the production of goods from Mexico that potentially uh, can uh, help to grow the Mexican economy. And as an additional comment, I would say that the common factor between the countries that you show that are having a degraded growth in your graphs, I guess one common factor of them is that they um, they had moved their economies from a, like, I would say, like from a basic economy to a more uh, uh, more technology advanced economies. So basically, I would like to understand the plans and, and policies on that area. Um, Thank you. <coughs> uh, <coughs> changing the. Changing the growth pattern requires a lot of effort, not only productive effort, but also in terms of the strategy. We need to find uh, sectors that had a lot of poten potentiality for creating employment, but also increasing um, productivity. And by doing so, we need to invest in innovation. Innovation means a lot of things. Innovation means, for instance, changing a productive process and producing uh, better tortillas. But also means to discover new materials, to uh, manufacture, uh, oh, um, how do you say, no tripulados, uh, automo automobiles no tripulados, non uh, autonomous vehicles. So it goes in a very wide range of, of, uh, of investment. So we need to find in which of those sectors we, we are very prepared for um, beginning, beginning uh, new productive lines. Uh, we need to connect different regions of the country. So we need to know what, is, what are the best uh, roads. We are studying already some of them, but we also want to get close to two critical components, universities and the private sector. We have been working with the private sector for a long time now. I have been having had meetings with all the Me Mexican industrial and commercial chambers and also with the university system because we, we really want to work on a triple helix uh, program. <laughs> Good. Oh, OK, OK. Well, thank you very much for the uh, information. Um, my name is Martin Unzueta. And uh, I'm immigrant here for 25 years now. And um, I have two questions, two yes. in, uh, important for me. Because before I came here to the United States, I got a small business in Mexico. And the really, the really thing is we couldn't do too much for us, for the workers. And most important thing is that the corruption was very high so and that's and that time. So I can say that we received the visit for different inspectors two times a week and they are asking for money. So in this in this kind of way we couldn't uh, save money to grow the business, to pay good to the workers. So the corruption was very high and it wasn't only me, so very others uh, all the other uh, members from my community, members that I, I know, they say the same way and in different levels, at may, maybe very high levels. So I think this is, a, um, this is something that the, the, the new government needs to take in account. So the education for these kind of persons, 
the sarin tosh with this with the uh, small, uh, with the uh, lowest level of uh, the production i think this is something that the, the the government needs to take into account and the other thing is that you you never refer to the new uh, the treatment between the us uh, mexico and canada this uh, now is called like uh, United States Mexico Canada Agreement. It's not NAFTA anymore. So, and uh, this is very important for the for the economy. For and the last thing is that uh, immigrants in the United States with documents or without documents are sending to Mexico twenty seven thousand million dollars a year, and this is a big big push for the economy in Mexico. What are we doing with that? Because if, if we take account that only the one percent of this of this money is saving, the other the other ninety nine percent is expending and is causing um, taxes. The 60, 60, 60, this six, I think. Sixteen. Sixteen percent. Yeah. So sorry. This is I I think I have a lot of questions, but it's okay. Okay. So, um, corruption uh, for, for, for the continuation of business in Mexico. Um, most of the corrup corruption, this, this corruption that you're referring to, occurs when there is this contact between the inspector and the taxpayer. One, one uh, possible route for that is the bancarization of many of that, those payments mm -hmm. and, um, and the reduction, the, the plain reduction of many inspections. So in uh, La Comisión Nacional de Mejora Regulatoria, we're working on how to reduce the inspection at its minimum. Not only that, but also to have, to have a system in which you you receive one inspector, not many. You don't, you don't receive the, uh, the inspector for the um, extinguidor. You don't have for the sanitary permit, the one for the uh, payroll, the one for, and so on. Uh, and, and then you have two or three inspectors per week all day long, all year long. So uh, wh what we're trying to see is whether we can have a sort of a joint inspection uh, brigade. That reduces the corruption, no? because you have different inspectors from different, and also making it, um, making it uh, aleatorio, um, random, right? So we're working on that. We still do not have a, the, the program uh, complete. Uh, we're exploring different models. Um, but also, and this is not an excuse, 80% uh, of, no, 60% of the tramits and, tramites and procedures are at municipal level, not at the federal level. 30% at the state level, and, no, and only 10% of all the inspection, it's because of the federal regulations. So what we would try to do is to really study the entire regulation problem and see whether we can cooperate with the state and municipal governments to improve that, in that to, to make improvements in that area. And regarding the TEMEC or USMCA, um, I think we, we learned a lesson. And it's not the, re, the important thing is not the result of the agreement. The important thing that we, we need to learn is that the, the new NAFTA, the TEMEC, or the U, U, USMCA is not longer a guarantee. Might not be there forever. So we need, we need to be prepared all the time to survive with or without the commercial agreement. I believe that the world is changing, and it's changing uh, a lot. 
It's not the, the new NAFTA. It's Brexit. It's the new NAFTA. It's many protectionist uh, terms that are present in the global economy. So it's better to be prepared and to be prepared for taking most of the advantages of the global forces, but also to be prepared to have a stronger domestic economy, to diversify it. Um, we have 80% of our trade, export trade with the US. Of this 80% of our export trade, uh, more than 50% goes to eight states. Only eight. And as you know, there are 50. We need to diversify not only to other countries, to other products, but within our, our uh, main uh, commercial uh, partner. So we, there is a lot of, of things to do within the new agreement. We need to work closely to the auto uh, auto industry because we need to meet new requirements. New, new requirements that for us give us the opportunity to build uh, a productive chains, chains to integrate this industry stronger with domestic um, sectors. So we are already talking to the different automakers in Mexico. But uh, again, diversification. We, we need to diversify our economy and not believe that NAFTA would resolve just everything and then we need to just wait. Uh, thank you for being here. Uh, my name is Pablo Galvez. Um, I'm curious to know, since uh, you were asked by the president-elect uh, to, to be the future minister uh, until taking up the, the, the new job in a few weeks, how has this transition been and how, uh, what's your expectation on the new job? It's been long, very long. Remember that the cabinet members were announced in December um, 15 last year. So we have been in the first part in this very uncomfortable position because beginning in, in December, I was uh, in San Diego in a sabbatical year. So I was in San Diego and it was very uncomfortable because people called me like secretaria. And I said, no, I'm not, secret I'm, I'm not even, I mean, the election is on July 2nd. So it, I'm not secretaria. Uh, I'm a professor at the Colegio de Mexico. And then, so it was very, a very long transition in this campaign phase. I did campaign with Lopez Obrador in Tijuana, in Guadalajara, in Monterrey in Mexico City, and then after the election has been very long, but very useful for people like me that doesn't have any experience, then I had the opportunity to meet in the Secretaría. I'm working in, a, in an office at the Secretaría de Economía in Mexico City, so I've been there and I've been working and talking to all public officials in the Secretaría for the past four and a half uh, months. I've been preparing different plans and interviewing and, and talking to, especially with the, the private sector. So it's been long. Um, this is the last time that this would happen. In the next election, actually, uh, Lopez Obrador would be the very first president that do, do not stay in office for six years. It would be, he would left office in September to shorten precisely the transition period. It's, it's way too long way too long and then it occurs that the, that the, um, the current uh, government stopped doing things and we cannot take any decision. And so there is this very strange and, and worry, worry uh, period. So that would be shortened for the next uh, time. Fortunately for me, uh, Secretary Guajardo has, be, has been very kind, very helpful. He has opened, uh, he's been very open and we have been uh, building a good relationship for the betterment of the Secretaria. 
Okay, thank you so much for being here. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the, one of the major plans of uh, your ministry to pass the Fondo Minero into the Ministry of, of, of Economics. And uh, also, maybe this is not re directly related to the Ministry of Economics, but if you, uh, if you could tell us if there's a project to raise the what mining companies are, 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 are paying to, to use Mexican, well, to exploit Mexican soil. Thank you. Okay, so uh, the Secretaría de Economía has this undersecretary of mining. Uh, up until 2014, uh, mining companies operating in Mexico didn't pay any royalties as in many other countries in the world, in Peru, and in Colombia, and in Canada, and in the US. Uh, besides taxes, mining companies pay uh, royalties. So um, in 2014, it was for the first time three different so-called derechos. These are not impuestos. They are called derechos, and it, it has a different fiscal treatment. So these uh, derechos uh, that, that talks about the lack of imagination of many economists, because they call derecho extraordinario, derecho especial, y derecho adicional. <laughs> they could have been more nice names, but in, in any case, it doesn't matter. So with these three uh, duties, royalties, uh, the, um, it create, the three royalties goes directly to the Fondo Minero, the, the mining fund. And the ma mining fund, its goal is remediation, either environmental remediation or social remediation. Uh, so it's a new policy. It's difficult to evaluate, but we what we know now is that um, it's not being applied properly, properly and especially because, um, for instance, you applied part of this money to a municipio. It has to go to a municipio, to a municipality. But because of, of the nature of the mining activity, uh, the mining activity is uh, being developed in, up in the mountains, right? In a very isolated, isolated place. So to this municipality, it pours money, a lot of money. But the workers working in this mining company live here in a different, completely different municipality. And this municipality do not receive a single penny. So what we're trying to connect is to, to form polygonos, areas of mining activity and mining influence. And therefore, the money could be uh, really applied to where the mining activity uh, interact with communities and with the economy. Um, it's difficult, it's uh, mining in itself is very controversial. I've been, I have been twice in Canada just to study the mining companies because most of the uh, foreign investment in, in Mexico in mining is from Canada, so I've been in Canada. I've been talking to uh, social organizations. Uh, I've been learning a lot. I, I didn't know that there are social organizations that want to prohibit any mining activity, zero. I mean, so I've been to those who want to open pit uh, mining all over Mexico, and those on the other hand that want to prohibit any mining activity. So we need to find ways in in how to, design, to, to get the best application of the mining fund. So far, we have learned the idea of the area. 
the idea of talking to the communities, involving the communities. And there is this extraordinary anecdote in which public officials went to a community and asked uh, pobladores, jewelers, uh, what was the project they wanted. And they said, we want um, dos topes. Um, how do you, huh? Speed, Speed bumps. Good. And they write it down. Dos topes en la avenida principal. <laughs> and it was a very small town with, with no, no traffic problems, not even a traffic light. So why they do they want the traffic it's, it's speed bumps? And then they go back and ask them, why is that you want the topes? Oh, because we want the kids to play football. Aww. So they wanted a football uh, field, <laughs> not the topes, <laughs> right? So we need to be very sensitive and to learn what do they want, what do they want, and what because this is this is a huge uh, fondo. It's uh, around cuatro mil millones de pesos. It's not it's not peanuts, and I I assume that it could grow up to ocho ocho mil millones. So we need and for me to ask the companies to pay the royalties and to increase the, col the collection of the fondo, first of all, I need to use it properly. I need to give some results. I need to work with the communities. I need to work with the Indian communities. For instance, in San Luis Potosí, in the coat of arms, it has a, a small Montecito. And because of a mining project, it's gone. Why do we do that? There are many Montecitos around San, in San Luis Potosí. Why do we just cut the little uh, Montecito that was on the coat or arms? And of course, people is very angry and people do not like mining companies. And, uh, and what was, I was telling you about the digital the lack of digital uh, projects in the Mexican government. Many concesiones mineras, mining concessions, are written down in paper notebooks. Concesiones mineras worth of millions of dollars. Can we have a tablet to register those? No? So I think there is a lot of, of of, 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 of opportunities for mining. Mining has a lot of history, and mining is very important. All our pueblos mágicos are pueblos mineros. So we're also touching the future when, when talking about mining. So we have to be very responsible. Okay, well, I know there's a bunch of questions. However, we are out of time for the formal part of this. She will be here for just a few minutes if you want to uh, ask something quick, if you can. All that remains is first to thank you all for joining us here today. Uh, second, uh, to thank uh, Dr. Marquez uh, for joining us uh, this evening to uh, remind her that we shall be inviting her again in uh, some time to hear more about what the government is doing, when it's actually doing something <laughs> beginning in two weeks. And finally, uh, and as a form of thanking you, we just want to wish you um, good luck in all of your endeavors, not just for you personally, but I think we'll all agree, whatever our views are, that Mexico needs a lot of good luck and that uh, hopefully it will get some going forward in tackling all of the very difficult and serious problems that he has. So thank you, Iwana Suerte. Thank you, Emilio.